Hey guys, time to get in on the action for the biggest moments in basketball with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections, place your entry, and win up to 100 times your money. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use the code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. This is Scott Richmond and Arnie Sherman. You're listening to What Do You Know on News Talk KGVO, AM 1290 and 98.3 FM. Arnie Sherman, a good Sunday morning. Well, a good holiday season to you, Scott. You know, ever since Thanksgiving, this town has been spruced up for the holidays. Downtown looks great. The office here looks great. You know, we've had our uh, Kissmas celebration. Yeah. And uh, we're going to have a very interesting show today to talk about a, uh, an organization that at the holiday season is worthy of our listeners paying attention to and helping them out. 100% agree, Arnie. And Lo- it's Watson's Children's Center. Yeah, Watson Children's Center, a local chari- a local organization helping people right here in Missoula. Right. They, they like to call it Watson's Children's Home. Which right, is for the official name, but I like to call it a center because they're doing other kinds of things. They're doing parental education. They're doing a whole host of programs there that we'll talk with their director about today. But it is a great program to pay attention to if you're in the holiday spirit and in the and in the charitable mood. the The Watson facility is, is well worth uh, uh, considering as a as a contribution. Arnie, when I moved here ten years ago. Uh, I saw, I could not believe how many not-for-profits and family-oriented not-for-profits there are in our little city here. And, uh, you know, you know better than I, right? Just all the folks that are actually out there who are helping young families and helping, uh, you know, homeless families, children that don't have families. And so, uh, you know, what what is it about Missoula? Well, I think it's a combination of the type of people that live here. And also in smaller towns, you know everybody more than you know anywhere else. And so if you know other families and you know people are in need, uh, you know the people that perhaps work at these organizations, they're your neighbors. It's it's a very close-knit community in that way, particularly on the helping end of the spectrum. And so people people have a lot of largesse towards all of these organizations. I think Missoula has more... Not for profits per capita than almost any town in the United States, and and that's a, you know that that's a a, a blessing and a curse at the same time. It means we have lots of needs. You wouldn't need right. all these organizations if there weren't needs. But at the same time, the community has taken it upon itself to to respond, which is beautiful. So our guest is Mark Roberts. He is the executive director of Watson Children's Shelter Children's Shelter and Home, and we will be back right after this. Ernie, we are back with our guest, Executive Director of Watson Children's Shelter, Mark Roberts. Mark, it's great having you here today. Yeah, thanks, guys, for having me today. I think a lot of people who are our listeners know something about Watson's Children's Shelter. I mean, it was started in 1968 as a daycare center, and then in 77, it became Watson's Children's Receiving Home. But over time, it's you know it has morphed into a, a program that serves infants through the age of 14, and it's more than just, you know, crisis intervention stay. It's much more turning into much more intermediate stay. So can you give our listeners a a brief understanding of of what the program looks like in 2022 heading into 2023? Sure, Arnie. It sounds like you're uh, vying for my job because that's (laughs) most of the information right there that I got. Um, (laughs) Yeah, you know, you you nailed it. It started out really nonprofit in 1977 as Watson Receiving Home. Um, out of a small little house on 4th Street, Janice Watson. Um, she started as a Jack and Jill daycare uh, originally, and then uh, over time it morphed into a receiving home um, as those in our community didn't have a safe place to go after being removed from a, you know, a, a scary situation. Um, so it, it really changed into that's what she was you know, doing more of, and and uh, over the course of time and uh, executive directors, um, Fran Albrecht being one that we were talking about earlier. Sure. Coming in and, and really setting a, a stage for what Watson is today in 2022. Uh, we have two homes. Um, we have one uh, next to 
Community Medical Center um, uh, in Fort Missoula, and that houses eight uh, beds, and eight of our kids stay there. Uh, in 2010, we built another home uh, out near the Peak Racket Club. Um, that's our Buckhouse location. That's 16 beds there. And so collectively, we take care of uh, 24 kids uh, a day, um, 365 days a year, uh, 24 hours. And uh, unfortunately, for the last 10 or so years, we've been completely full. I mean, there might be a day or two that goes by uh, to where we don't have uh, one of those beds filled, but it doesn't take long. Uh, for that bed to fill up. So, mm. and not just kids from Western Montana, you know, all across the state, um, every county, every region Is in Montana. Is there no one else like Watson across the state that does quite what you do? So, there are quite a few um, youth emergency shelters and receiving homes. There's only two of us in the state mm. that take kids infants to three. Uh, most of those start at five and above. So, here in Western Montana, we're the only ones that take the little of the littles. So, Mm. Um, and what is the reason the little littles come in? They want the, the infants to three year olds. So thankfully, we don't get a lot of them. You know, they right. they they foster. Uh, you know, there's foster families and and you know next of kin and, and families that'll come in, take those. But um, you know, really ratio. I, I think it, when you get down to it, the state of Montana uh, doesn't do a great job in reimbursing um, for the level of care that's needed for those little ones. You know, it's, it's a one-to-one -one ratio for our littlest one. So one staff member for one kid, you know, right. to where all the other kids in our shelter, you know, it's a one-to-four ratio. Um, and we try to do better than that. You know, we, we yeah. try to keep it to like a one-to-three. You know, these kids are coming from a traumatic situation. And, you know, the more care and eyes on them and, and compassion we can give them, we try to. So, As in the a previous life when I was doing youth work, the uh, – Runaway shelters and the receiving homes and the emergency short-term care facilities uh, had a preponderance of girls to boys. Is that still the case? We're about 50-50 mix right now. Really? Um, yeah. We, you know, we just ra ran a report for the year when we were doing demographics, and it was pretty split, 50-50 uh, down, uh, boys to girls. Um, our average age is 10 years old through the yeah. shelter Ooh. this year. So um, that kind of... That varies from year to year, but over the course of 2020, uh, 2021, um, average age was 10, 11 year old. And is there a common theme of the precipitating event that leads a kid to the shelter? It's a lot of different breakdown. Um, you know, drug abuse and homelessness right now is really some of the leading factors. Of, of, their, of the people that are taking care of them. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, so them ending up in the shelter. Sure, um, right. So the household breakdown. Um, in that way. Some there for protective care as well? A couple there for protective care. Um, you know, tough stories nobody wants to talk about, but, you know, there's trafficking in our community. And, you know, there's... Well, you live on an interstate. I mean, we're yeah. a transient community. And so, yeah, we, right. we, we have a couple children that just break your heart to know that, you know, at the age of 8 to 12, they've been, they've been trafficked for <laughs> 4 to 5 years. Of their life. That's and, shocking. But, and and as, you're right, as you're right, people don't want to hear that, but they need to hear it. Right. You know, and that's yeah. that, that's the biggest thing for, for Watson right now. You know, in the Missoula community, we have 30,000 30, new residents, you know, that had moved in over COVID. And so just really getting out and doing stuff like this and being on TV and getting in the community and letting people sure. know that it's here too, you know, and you, you can't turn a blind eye to it and, you know, the support and help. So how long have kids? you been the uh, the executive director? So I just celebrated my one year anniversary a couple weeks ago. So and what were you doing before that? Before that, I was in early childhood education. Um, so me and a, a group of people we opened up a child care facility here in Missoula. Ran that for about five years. Um, we're super excited to expand into the Missoula community and, and open up a whole new way of, of early childhood education. We we're going to do 240 kids in the old Cold Springs Elementary School. Uh, and then we signed a lease right at the beginning of COVID. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, timing is everything, yeah, right? That, so that, that, uh, that, that project ended, unfortunately. And, um, you know, some partners at the United Way um, picked, mm. that, picked that project up. And uh, I'm still on the steering committee for that and working with that. But I did that for five years. And then prior to that, I was in academic publishing and psychology. So mm. how, did this, how did this opportunity with Watson present itself to you? Great question. Uh, so one of my buddies, he's on the board um, and knew that I was phasing out of childcare. 
knew that I had this new love, passion, desire, and drive uh, to, one, help out our community, but two, to also help out kids in need. Um, and he's like, you know, you'd be a perfect fit for this job. Um, and I kind of chuckled at him and laughed at him because I'm not your typical executive director that lives in a social work field. Right. You know, I, I came from a business background and, you know, just kind of working up through IT and, and business. And after about a two month interview process, yeah, I was given the opportunity to take it over and I, I'm so thankful I'm here, uh, to do the work. So what was the, the steepest learning curve for you? Oh, steepest learning curve for me would probably be in week two um, when we got kind of the first intake under my watch. Under my watch, that was probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to wow. experience. We had a we had a, a kid come in uh, from the other side of the state uh, near the tail end of the day, about six o'clock at night. Um, shoulders hunched down, head down. You know, no more tears to cry. Doesn't understand why five hours ago he was you know in the Billings area and. Now he's here in Missoula with, with no family, and and uh, it was that was one of the toughest things. It's very tough. It was it was really hard. I'd, I'd never experienced so much uh, emotion in, in a small in a yeah. small time frame. Um, that you know, as soon as I got in my truck and I was driving home, I, I called that same board member buddy of mine, and I let him have it <laughs> <laughs> for for getting me into this field, but. <laughs> You know, the next day, the next two days. You're not prepared. Nope, you, people aren't prepared for this. Yeah, it's not a, unless this is their vocation. And they I mean, you can watch it on this. TV, but when you're right. in the room at the same time, it's a totally different experience. Oh, the, the, the level yeah. of emotion that you go through. Right. You know, it's 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 one hand. You you're wrapping your arm around them and saying, you know, we're here to keep you safe. We're here to protect you. This is your safe space. Right. Uh, but then in the other hand, it's like, why would somebody hurt you? I, you're 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 so innocent, and and you have that emotion of of anger and frustration that you know you don't you don't know how to deal with it. It's very difficult. When, in in a previous life, when I was running youth agency, we had a runaway shelter. It was part of the larger organization. We had a court diversion project. We had a a counseling program, of emergency uh, intervention services, youth employment. We we're doing all those sorts of things. But I made sure that I met every single kid that came into our runaway shelter. That was 248 kids in mm, a year. Sure. I, even if they, if they came in the middle, I was there every day, and I met the new kid, and I wanted to know what the staff were dealing with. And so when, they, when we had a staff meeting and talked about, you know, Lewis's problem or Sherry's problem, I at least knew who the kid was they were talking about. And, and it takes an emotional toll. I was working 70, 80 hours a week yeah. and had no other life except – you know, trying to deal with them and then dealing what with the powers. Fo- what for both of you? <laughs> what what kind of keeps you going? Because it is emotionally takes because, its toll on you, but also time wise, your family. You have a family. So, what is it that you think? Because I think you found something in yourself that you didn't know, maybe was dormant or maybe was not being used to its full capacity when you were doing business. Something you found something in yourself that allows you to. Not only do this, but to do it well. Yeah. Well, for me, I well, I come from a family of seven. I'm near the bottom of seven kids. Okay. Um, so I, you know, family and cousins and, you know, that was just a big part of my growing up. And, you know, when I got married, you know, I was like, how many kids are we going to have? You know, well, I want five. Well, we settled uh-huh. on two. Right. <laughs> and so having the, having the two that we have and knowing, you know, the, the type of life that they have and how lucky that they are yeah. to be in this situation. Um, that they are in sitting there and trying to give that to these other kids. Right. I, I think, you know, one of the things that keeps me going and keeps me um, so passionate about it is really on exit day. You know, w- when those kids are, you know, hopefully reunited with, with their family mm-hmm. um, and they've gone through the work and they've done that work and you see that joy um, back in that they're moving out to a foster home, right? Maybe it's a permanent placement. Maybe it's a temporary placement, but giving those children a new start, giving those kids a new start at life and hoping, hoping that their little time with us made such an impact that they, won't go, the they won't go down sure. that same path, that well, same road. Well, I have an anecdote. So yeah. we had somebody with, we just finished Kiss Miss for Kids, which we did with Mark uh, and Watson. They were the financial financial pa- engine, if you will, of, uh, of the giving, right, of the donations. Mm-hmm. There was one member of the community who came out of foster care. He's in foster care starting at one years old. He's now 
working, a professional, runs a business. He alone. $10,000. Yeah. He yeah. helped generate $10,000 yeah. and came back yesterday with another two, some crazy number. I don't, want to, I don't need to give his name because I don't know if he would want or not want me to, although he's on the radio, it's John. But, um, <laughs> but I'm amazed. Like That's, that's exactly what, what you just said. You've changed, someone changed the course of his life, and he felt it's his responsibility to give back. So here's my story. When I was working in adult yes. corrections, I was running halfway houses for ex-convicts. The, 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 the well-known and most uh, outspoken uh, youth advocate in Cincinnati, where I was, was uh, a fellow named Paul Hahn, who later he wrote textbooks on, the, on uh, crime and punishment and, and yeah. diversion and, and was a professor at Xavier University. And he once told me a story about uh, visiting a guy who was on death row. And he was getting, he was up for execution. And they had him strapped in the chair, you know, this according to Paul, and he did never exaggerate it. And they asked him if he had anything to say to the audience. There were, you know, all these people visiting, you know, yeah. and, and reporters and, and corrections people. And there, it was sort of a, you know, like you see in the old Western movies, people like to come to the hanging. They like to come to the execution. And he looked out at the crowd and said, if I had this attention when I was a kid, and really needed it, I wouldn't be here now. Yeah. Wow. You know, and that, to me, it's made everything. me think, you want to get them earlier on in the process. When I was trying to get guys who were coming right. out of the joint after 10 years and trying to integrate them back in society, right. if, you, if you got 40% of them, you were, you were a big success. And I realized you needed to get them earlier. Yeah. And you're seeing right away when, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old who were, in dysfunctional families and in dysfunctional situations, you got to figure out a way to extricate them from that, and then and then figure out a pathway forward that is not uh, as a debilitating and traumatic. Sure. Yeah, I mean that's. Mm. And about five years ago, you know, Watson looked at that same thing to the board of directors, and um, six years ago now, and they started Healthy Foundations, a Watson program that comes alongside a family prenatally um, before the child is born. Mm. And helps through the process of that. I mean, being a parent in, a, in and of itself, let alone with, with other factors in life, is tough. Well, and, and many of these kids' parents are, not, are 16, 17, 18 years old. Yeah. They're yeah, not, not prepared equipped. to be parents. Mark, what's, what's the history? Who is Watson? Who is the Watson and Wat, Watson Children's Shelter? So it's Janice Watson. So she was the originator um, who started the Jack and Jill Daycare and was a renowned school teacher here in Missoula. Mm. Um, in the mid late sixties. Um, and then when she retired, um, we're just the namesake, you know, of all of her hard work that she's done. It's amazing. So, yeah, you're full all the time, pretty much we're full all the time. Unfortunately, the families oh. of these kids are not financially very well off in most cases. Typically not. So how do you pay for Watson children? <laughs> how do we pay for what? That's a great question. Well, um, so we're about a $2 million organization. Um, you know, of that currently about 45% of that comes from the state of Montana. So reimbursement right now, we're on a reimbursement matrix of $89, about $89 a day per kiddo. Um, but the services we provide for that kid are, are much more than that. Yeah. You know, that's not a lot of money. Yeah. Um, so then we fundraise for the rest of it. Um, uh, you know, things like year end appeals, our tennis program, bike for shelter, mm. um, uh, ho or our holiday home tour that we just had and heart happy homes, just a bunch of different fundraisers. Um, and then, you know, gen donate, right. yeah, generous foundations, um, that come in and, uh, support a lot of that. Now, hopefully start of the new year, we do pay matrix, um, by some of the stuff that we're doing. So hopefully we can take that $89 a day and turn that into something closer to one fifty through the state of Montana. Well, that would be good. Yeah. And then sitting there and, and going with a coalition of like-minded you know, organizations to go to Helen and, and fight for some more, um, you know, some more funding. Sit there and get, get Coalition these Coalition is the best way to do it. Yeah, come together as a, a collaborative. Okay. <laughs> because there's, there's, there's a, not only safety in numbers, so you're not singled out, but it's also the, you know, they can count votes. Um, oh, okay. You know, you, I mean, you're going to legislators, you're going to state directors, you're going to see the governor, you're going to see other people, they see... You know, they can add it up. Uh, 
Back in the 80s, I was in Chicago running a, a coalition of youth agencies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the governor at that time, Jim Thompson, cut human service funding, cut it across the board. Sure. So we put they put a coalition together called, at that time, ICOI, which was, oh, uh, no, I care, Illinois Coalition Against Reagan Economics. It was under Ronald Reagan. <laughs> and they asked this young guy, hey, you can be the chair of this. And I went up to Helena. And that's all they want to know. How many, what towns, how many organizations, how big a staff? They were just counting numbers and counting votes. You know, and it's unfortunate, yeah. you know, rather than, than uh, being uh, concerned as much about the kids. The other thing we did, which, uh, which uh, turned out to be a, uh, a, smart, a smart move in those days, there we see this as sort of, you know, liberal blah, blah, blahs. So we got the most conservative state legislator mm. at that time. Uh, his name was Aldo De Angelis, and and unfortunately Aldo had had a niece who had committed suicide, and so he was very much at that point sensitive to the plight of uh, you know young children in in trouble, and he became the spokesperson on the legislative side for our group, and and that coalition became unbeatable. Yeah, wow. So, so you almost like you 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 cement it with somebody from a conservative ilk background, and then everyone follows. Well, they couldn't come in and slam us for, right, for, being, for being a bunch of liberal do-gooders, you know, that kind of stuff. You politics know. enter into your role? Uh, thankfully, children are really a bipartisan you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> topic. So, no, not, not much. I mean, when you're talking about funding, you know. Horse trade at all? Maybe a little bit here and there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, who doesn't yeah. have to well, negotiate? Yeah, well, it's easy to talk about it in the past tense and in the, in the, in the present tense. So... Are there organizations in Missoula that you rely on for ancillary services to help out what you're doing? Are there, are there go-to partners that fit nicely with Watson Children's Shelter? Uh, first and foremost, one of our biggest partners is Missoula County Public Schools. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, they, uh, the, not only the level of care that they come in and provide the kids um, schooling-wise, but they're also – a lot of the times our first level of, of defense and uh, the first hand raisers of something that might be a situation at right. home. Well, they can see stuff going on in classrooms, right? Yeah. Or so the kid's not coming to class. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, around that too, beach transportation, right? They, six buses will pull up in front of our two houses to take the kids to school. So, wow. you know, not having to sit there and shuttle all those kids. Uh, but then, you know, there, there's others like AWARE um, yeah. that, you know, that come in and, and provide um, some services. Families for, First, do you work with them a little bit? Um, not to my knowledge. Okay. That's a great question. Uh, I'm sure, our, I'm sure our social worker would know. YMCA partners for our summer programs. Um, we yeah. have some generous donors that like all of our kids get swimming lessons, right? So they're all done That's at the great. YMCA. We've so. had them in, right, Arne? Yeah. They have they're expanding their childcare and daycare. They were going to build a new facility. They are. And that'll be helpful in the community. We have you know expanding our capability and our matrix of services that we can offer. And that's the big thing too, right? That's why while I would love to expand Watson and and put it into you know the Pablo area or up the Bitterroot. Um, it's really you need those services. You need the services that are based here in Missoula right. around you to help right. support the work and mission that we're doing here as well. Is there so. Are there plans for, to grow, to be able to accommodate, take in more children? I hope so. Yeah. You're a year in. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're probably just getting – you're kind of figuring it all out and have for the last 12 months. But now, what's the net, what's, where do you want to go with it, right? <laughs> Having evaluated – you know, so this, so the state, from my understanding, the state has a lot of say in where we can go. I see. Right. So they have to prove, you know, the opening of a new shelter if it's going to be partially funded through state funds. I mean, we could open up a shelter probably anywhere and run it off private donations, um, which isn't totally sustainable. You, you know, you need that. You need that, you need that support sure. from the state. So, you know, the state has a little bit of say in where shelters can be placed um, and where. They can open to provide more care. You know, I know from my understanding, when we opened our Healthy Foundations program, one of the things was to look at opening another shelter in Missoula. And that wasn't, while it wasn't frowned against, it was, well, there's quite a few shelters in Missoula right now. You have your youth homes, you've got Watson, um, which makes up a a big portion um, Mm. of those emergency shelter care placements. So, Getting back to the programs there, when when, when a child youth comes into the shelter 
whose jurisdiction do they are they under at that point? Are they under the court's jurisdiction? Yes. Yep. So at that point, parental rights have been taken away. Right. They are under the, the court's um, power. Right. Um, and that's when they're placed with us. Right. So, um, Can yeah. a kid just walk in? No, unfortunately not. They've got to be placed there by the court system mm. or the state. There's an intake process. Yes. yes. Yep. That has to be. Let's do a quick ID. Our guest is Mark Roberts. He's the executive director of Watson Children's Shelter here in Missoula. And a guest of ours and also a partner of ours because he helped partner with Kissmas for Kids. Tell, tell us this. Been there, you've been there now for 12 months. Um, you're kind of getting the lay of the land. Are there initiatives or programs that you'd like to start putting into play that you're in the development process you know, you're, you're developing currently? Yeah. You know, I would like to see uh, just generally across the board uh, more therapeutic care coming in, you know, um, not only with our kids, but I think kids across the state uh, need a lot more social and emotional help. Um, maybe not having it at that young age. Um, sure. You know, of zero to three. I'm trying to rebuild that or build that for the first time uh, with them. So, you know, there's a, there's a couple of agencies out there and, that I would love to partner and work with uh, friends of the children being one of them. Um, What's that Ben? So Ben Davis, he is the executive director over there and what they are is they're uh, a mentoring program for children. They, they try to start them ages like five, six and they'll go all the way through 18. Mm. So you have a friend or a partner or a mentor with a child for 10, 12 years of that child's life. So a common person that knows that child very well. Um, You know, it's a little difficult for us since we get a lot of children from all across the state that right now their services are just based here in Missoula. So it's hard for us to identify, you know, a a child that's going to be staying in this community. And these these mentors, same age, like uh, uh, just a little older or are they adults? They're adults. So it's like big brothers, big sisters. It's like big brothers, big sisters on a dopamine rush. Like they're just constant, constant with the child. You know, it's, um, they're paid positions. They're not volunteer positions. Oh, okay. um, so really their employees that they're getting, their friends that are working with the kids are committed okay. to the organization. And it's their job. Really. It's their job. Yeah. Um, Give them a shout out. How do people get in touch with them? Oh, you know, I was just say Google Friends of the Children Missoula. Friends of the Children yeah. Missoula. And right. Ben Davis is the executive director. He's the executive director over there. Okay. Let me go back to another technical point, but I'm interested in what happens here in the community. What happens when a kid from out of state, they pick them up on the, the, the police pick them up on the highway, you know, whether they're abused or they're being trafficked or whatever. Yeah. Where does that kid go? Great question. We actually had one of those incidents this summer. So um, there was a family member uh, driving a child across the country. Um, they ended up coming through um, the Missoula area. Uh, the mother was on drugs, out of her mind, still driving. Um, the child convinced the mom to pull over, um, got in the driver's seat, and and drove until he hit Missoula and found a police officer. Oh, my gosh. Uh, so that child um, quickly, right, removed. That, that process happened really fast. We had an opening, so the child ended up staying with us just for a couple of days until another family member could come from out of the state to pick him up. Right. So um, – you know, we try to hold uh, a bed or two available. Um, our capacity is a little higher than 24, mm. um, but ratio reasons we keep it there. But we always try to hold one or one or two right, beds just for that yeah, reason. I mean, those things you happen. Um, so, yeah, you know, kids from across, you know, different states, um, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Idaho. But same, too. You know, Montana one time was at such capacity – um, over capacity with mm. children for emergency shelter care that we reached out to other shelters in other states. Mm. Some of them, I don't believe, were vetted as well as they should have been. Right. Um, but, yeah, a, a, pl- a bed for a, a child in need. Right. You can't put them in adult jail. They used to. I know they did. Yeah. That's crazy. When I, well, that's what they uh, needed to do, though, right? When they were doing that in Illinois... 55 kids in one year had committed suicide in adult jails and lockups in the state. Oh, my God. Because can you imagine being a 16 or 17-year-old thrown in with hardened 
you know, got, you know, in most cases it was men that were put in those situations, boys with boys yeah. with men. What's it? So let me bring it. Let me bring us up a little bit. Here. Yeah, let's bring us up. It's Christmas. It's holiday time. It's, it's holiday it is holiday time. Mark, what's a good day for you at Watson? What does it look like? Oh, when a twenty thousand dollar donation comes in, <laughs> money, 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 money. No, beyond no. that. <laughs> yeah, beyond, beyond. No, really, beyond that. Um, weekends are, are super fun. You know, I'll pop over to the shelter and uh, hang out with the, with the kids in the back, and you see that they're just kids being kids, right? Yeah. They're not so much focused about, you know, maybe for a glimpsing moment, you know, that the life that they came from. Um, Right now uh, in the shelter, we have uh, a kid that's super into Mario Kart. So he built this little, like, Mario Kart group. And they sit there and they, like, challenge, like, this past Saturday, they were challenging each other to to Mario Kart races and, you know, the Mm -hmm. laughs, the smiles, the giggles, you know, the, just the kids being kids in that Mm -hmm. moment was, is, is really awesome. Knowing that they have a place to do that where they are safe is that big highlight moment. Do you have kids of your own? I do. I have two kids. I have a 13 year old daughter and a 10 year old son. I've been saying nine for a whole year. So I got to catch myself because he just turned 10. And they, and they're, and they like what you do for a living they're they're participant um not not participants they understand what it is i do got it um you know they you have to keep that balance they, they, they go to school with some of the kids in our sure. shelter and but you so, have to keep that balance as yeah. a parent right to not put too much right. over to the job and not enough to them and vice versa right, right. right. that's really hard yeah how do you manage that balance by intuition. Yeah. Just well, look the on same, hand, is They're the same yeah. age as some of the kids in the shelter. Yeah, right? 100% they are. Right. You know, so, um, so that, that gives me a little leg up too, right? Like working with some you of these kids. You know how to work with kids that age. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and, you know, my, my kids are incredibly active and incredibly busy. And, and so being able to talk about, you know, their highs of their day, you know. Yeah. It, it, it's, it really you, brings it, you know, turns and, it around. And your thankfulness that they're not the kids that right. are in the shelter, yeah. right? And and vice versa. I mean yeah. they they know. You know, it's they know how lucky sure. um, that they are that they were, you know, born into, you know, the situation that Just they were a stable, supporting, loving, caring yeah. family. Yeah. Do you feel like birth order and the pecking order of where you fall in in terms of your sibs uh was helpful to kind of, you know, how do you negotiate when you're in a room full of kids? <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a great question. So it uh, you know my pecking order and my birth order in, in my family was uh, my parents. They had five kids in five years. Yeah, they had two kids within a year. So, <laughs> and then they took a seven year break, and uh, then I came along. Me too. I'm yeah. seven years. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's 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 a little bit different, right? You you know my older siblings, like an only child. Yeah. Well, then I got a younger brother who's three years younger than me. Ah. So, um, but you know they were my older siblings were definitely more like my aunts and uncles, mm. right? Because as when I start to have like super vivid fond memories, it's like when they're getting ready, getting ready to graduate high school to go to college, right? right. you know? So knowing that I was all, so I had, you know, multiple parents, I guess, if you will, if you want to look at my older siblings as sure. being, that, definitely. The, being the caregivers of, of my little brother and I. So even though, you know, my mom and dad were ultimately that, but there was just multiple hands helping. And you grew up here in Montana? I did. I grew up in Helena. Okay. And so, yeah. Born and raised there. Came over to the university in 2000. So I uh, graduated from there in 2004. And now I'm a Missoulian. I've lived here longer than I have in Helena. So. Yeah. And we're glad. Proud this, of whole that. Se- this whole century. <laughs> yeah. This, you lived here this whole century. The yeah. Y2K did not take them down. No. No. So, <laughs> so it is the holiday season. And I know from past experience that at the holiday season, there are extraordinary needs at a program like this. I mean, you want to get kids holiday gifts and you want to have holiday decorations. So what are the needs right now at, at the Watson Shelter? So our big needs right now are your, your daily needs that you would have at home. Your toilet paper, your um, paper towels, soap, you know. Uh, we have, we are so lucky to be in this community. Um, all of the kids wishes, I mean, Nintendo switches and yeah. boom, ball, I mean, just the things right. that, you know, these kids, the they were all granted to them. 
by five or six corporate partners here in, That's fantastic. in this community. Huge. And so, you know, for us right now, you know, some of our biggest things are, you know, when we take a kid in at, at any hour of any day, um, we might not have the size of clothes for them. So like Target and Walmart gift cards are so valuable right. to us Sure, to be able to sit there and be like, all right, well, here he's 12, but he's six, two. I don't have <laughs> pants for, uh, yeah. you know, someone that's six, two. Basketball so, too. Right. Yes. So if people go to your website, yep. it's listed on your website, what your needs are. Isn't yes. It? So Watson's children, shelter.org. And then ways to give. There's a couple different like bullet point areas down there. There's the general needs. That's the big one. We always have an Amazon, you know, wish list that's out there uh, sure. for that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, just very thankful for all the, you know, community help that we get. Yeah, people don't realize somebody shows up 2 o'clock in the morning, doesn't have, they're in dirty clothes or ripped clothes or, you know, partially clothed. Yeah. And they have, you got you and you got to have stuff there for them. You just can't wrap them in a towel. So that's one of right. the, that's one of the super great things that we're, we're able to do here, you know, at Watson is, you know, the moment a child walks in, we don't know how long their stay is going to be with us. Mm. But they instantly get five days of new pants, five days of shirts, five days of underwear, socks, toiletries, brand new bedding. And if they leave in two hours, they get to take all that stuff and start a new somewhere else. Right. That's great. Mm. And then the longer they're with us, yeah, then they build up the, the wardrobes right. of clothes. And what is the range of stay there? We didn't cover that. Yeah. So the range of stay prior to COVID prior <laughs> to me coming on was, was typically, you know, 60 to 90 days. It was really, um, meant to be short-term emergency care. Right. Right now, we pulled numbers from 2021. We're over 370 days oh, that really? average, on average wow. that a child is with us. A so year. we have a couple kids in our care right now that are going to be celebrating, you know, their third Christmas with us. Oh, That's man. too long, right? I mean. Yeah. This is supposed to be short-term right? aid yeah. to help them get back to where they're going. We, you know, with their families, with their families or, or, surrogate, or family. a surrogate family. Right. Yeah. Uh, as I came on last year, uh, Watson said goodbye to one of its longest residents. Um, this person had been in and out of Watson for 10 years, but had lived in the time that they lived in Watson. They lived in Watson for eight years. Mm. And with their circumstances about that particular case that were that unusual that they couldn't find another Living situation for that child? You know, I, I don't know about the specific child. Um, I know that they that some foster placements didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to be a foster parent is it's a lot of work. You know, um, mm. it's not just it's not just you know fostering a child and being like, okay, I've got you, go free, be free and run. <laughs> right. You know, that's it's not it's structure and it's it's tough work. You know, mm -hmm. so you know in this specific case i know that she was placed in a couple of foster homes there was some breakdown there and then um when she she was 15 um so we extended our license uh, up to 15 and took care of her for a little bit longer but she uh found a long uh term placement uh with a home in idaho so from my understanding yeah. she reached back out to us because we don't get a follow them that's one of the sad things yeah too. you don't know what happens uh, yeah, we, <laughs> you know but if, if they reach back out to us and let us know how they're doing in their stories and she reached out to our program director uh, who's been with watson for almost 40 years um deborah madonna i was going to say yeah. Mark, you uh, it would you have to have somebody like that yeah. Yeah. The you have a great team. memory talk about your team a little bit because i i've met several of them and i know how how committed and they are so what's your organization look like? Yeah. So our, we have a fantastic team. Um, you know, we employ about 50 employees, mm -hmm. um, direct care staff, all the way through our healthy foundation staff. Um, and it really starts at the top. You know, the our development director, Angie Doucette, um, you know, she's been with Watson for a little over four years now. Um, she was really the one that I shadowed in, in my, sure. you know, my first couple months there because there was no executive director really in place when I got started. Um, so followed her along uh, quite a bit, got to learn the ropes. Our, our finance director, um, Becky, has been with Watson for uh, over five years. Um, so you, they're fantastic as far as like at front admin, right? Yep. And then you got the back of the house and you got other programs. So you have Deborah Madonna that's been with Watson coming up on 40 years. She worked at the daycare wow. with Janice. Wow. So she is, she's, she's gone the through the, yeah, yeah, 
She's, she's the connected. She's the legacy and the history, you know, from Janice all the way through today. And what oh. about the most important person beside you, the cook? Who cooks oh, for all I these kids? I tell you what, Krista, she's uh, <laughs> she's our kitchen manager. She produces over thirty, what well, thirty two, about thirty two thousand meals a year. I know it's incredible. So um, she's got those she's got those kids on a on a good eating schedule. They start in the morning early and wrap up with home cooked meals at the end of the day. So. I wonder, uh, she probably is very good friends with Cisco and uh, <laughs> U.S. Foods. U.S. Foods, Cisco, right? Costco. Because that's one of the highest cost items yeah, in, in the operation. It's, it's feeding 24 people every day plus staff. It's not too bad. It's about $56,000 a year um, that's you know, it. for our food budget. Yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, meal costs are, 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 she's got it nailed down pretty well. That's pretty yeah. good. So, um, and it's, there's always room for seconds and thirds. So that's great. Yeah. Arnie, we're not eating there. You're looking at me like we should go eat there. No. No. No, 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 no. Right. No, we uh, – Arnie and I talk a lot about food on this show. Um, when I was running a halfway house, Rex Kahn's, we had this southern woman who came up to to work at the house. And she her, – her specialty were these pork chops and southern fried chicken. And we had 15 hungry guys wow. living in this. And she was making 50, 60 pork chops every night and, you know, 10 or 12 – Fried chickens and stuff, and I gained like thirty pounds <laughs> the first the first three months I was working there. And then I had to go and start playing basketball with the guys who got back in shape in those days. But it's it's an important part. That's also yeah. You sit around the table with the staff that's there, and they can hear what's going on during the day with the kids. You're really yeah, close. You're yeah. family, by the way, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, and they, you know, and everybody sits with the kids too. You know, it's family style. You know, sitting and eating for dinner. So, I mean, you, you really you get to know these children. Right. Uh, for however long they're there, but pretty well, you know. So yeah. you, you want that, that family environment, you know. But you also need the structure, too. Well, it's the structure, know? the routine. Yep, routines are the vitally family, important. see that you can be a group and not everybody's, you know, crazy. Yeah. Arnie, yeah. question for you. Yes. So you started your career kind of in this space. Yes. What was it like becoming right, right out of school kind of – Doing this because you were kind of thrown into the into the. I, I ran a halfway house when I was twenty two years old. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. For cons, you know, that were coming out of federal institutions. I visited every federal institution in the United States, uh, interviewing guys. The funny, I mean, there's a lot of uh, very interesting experiences that I went through in those days. I never met a guy in the joint who did committed the crime that he was in for. <laughs> they would all tell me, I did bad things, but the thing I'm in for, I never did. <laughs> so you had to be able to, you're, you're right. trying to find people. Halfway houses are used 90 days before the, they were supposed to be released into the general population. They're put in a halfway house to transition back, and that's the purpose. Right. And that's generally the purpose of halfway houses. And we would go out and try to interview and find um, potential inmates that would have a chance of making it through the program and being you know, return to society. And as we talked earlier, 40 or 50, if you got 40 or 50% that could do it, you know, you, you were, you were doing great. You were doing fantastic. You know, because most of them, it was hard to, they, you know, they were lifetime recidivists. They didn't just one day become a, uh, a criminal. Most of the cases were not, uh, you know, uh, you know, one time deal. It was a life of difficulties, except for crimes of passion. Some and you people, spent how many years working kind of in that space? The, I, I spent about 12, 12 years. Twelve years. Yeah, I ran. I ran children. I ran halfway house programs early on. Then I ran children and youth agencies. Then I ran a coalition of children and youth agencies. And then I ran a national children's organization. And then I moved into international leadership development, and, and then and, and that's international in business over. kind of stuff. So I had about what twelve advice, year experience. What advice would you give our guest, Mark Roberts, executive director of Watson? <laughs> well, I think he's doing that from what I can see. Everything, everything right. Right. Exactly. I mean. It's always about, you know, figuring out what you're missing and need to do f with the with population and finding the money for it. There's, there's two, the, the road goes in two directions when you're in the money arena. Either you have needs and you try to get money to fill those needs, or there's money available and you try to take, you try to contour the program for the money that's available, sure. or a combination of both is where it usually ends up being. But the, but you can't offer good programs without without resources. You need and, resources. And you know, talking you know, and, and and talking with Mark, you know, he's got the right idea about what needs to be done and getting more you know crisis intervention, family kind of work being done, and 
and more services for kids and, and getting in as early as you possibly can and, and doing all those sorts of things. But what I can tell you from doing this stuff 40 years ago or more, right? the programs haven't changed that much. You know, what we were doing back then is the same thing they're doing now. I mean, the, the, the solutions are not all of a sudden the, the new age of technology has right, changed right. the way we do this. But the new age of technology hasn't changed what you do with kids. You know, it's you got to right. give them attention rather than detention. You got to give them, um, you know, care and concern. You got to try to replicate a supportive environment so that they can grow and, right. and mature, mature. You know, and uh, it's it's the best you can do. When, when I was working with adult offenders, the best program I, I did my graduate you know thesis on that. The best thing you could do wasn't counseling them. Um, wasn't was getting a a normal schedule set up, getting them a job, and making them do it. Right. I mean, I would drag guys out of bed. I would throw buckets of water on guys, and drag them to their job, make them go in the hopes that it would stick. Creating normalcy. And after doing it for a while, getting a paycheck, meeting some normal people at work, and whatever job they had, most of the time they were low level kinds of jobs. They right. Were construction work and repair work and. But if you could force them into a, a schedule for 30 days, you had a reasonable chance that they might stick for a while. If you just let them on their own, just wander around, they were going to they were going to find their way Sound, back. And that sure. sounds consistent with what you're seeing too, right? Yeah, yeah. I That's mean, change, creating normalcy, creating regiment, the regimented schedule, some stability, stability. Yeah. Would you? Would you are you seeing other folks that came from the private sector moving into this into the not for profit around town? Is that more of a trend we're seeing where people are kind of like, hey, I'm done kind of private business or and I'd like to kind of lend my smarts wiles to this endeavor? Well, that's a great question. I never even thought about thinking about that. <laughs> well, because, you know, you are kind of you, you kind of did not take the traditional route. Yeah, yeah, I definitely didn't take the traditional route. I don't you know, I think COVID really shook up a lot of yeah. a lot a lot of different industries, right? And looking at how, you know, just employees alone, right? Trying to find sure. employees alone. But um I think people are passionate about whatever it is that they're into, right? right. In that moment. And you know, whether that's, you know, owning a car dealership and and having those daily connections there or I just found my passion in working and wanting to be with, uh, you know, around and help children. Yeah. You know, that's my, my wife and I joke, or, you know, joke around that everything that I had done in my previous careers and growing up here in Missoula has really led to this moment. Yeah. You know, surprisingly enough, I mean, being fortunate enough to be able to buy a house and then do like renovations and work on my house, you know, like, oh, we have a club. Pl plug toilet at Watson. Okay, I can fix that. I know how to fix that. You know, yeah, though, yeah, yeah. It's 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 just interesting. Like some of those some of those things, and yeah, we, we joke around a little bit. Like literally everything I've done up, you know, through the daycare has has led to this moment to be in this position. So it sure. really is great. Let's take a quick break. Our guest is Mark Roberts, Executive Director of Watson Children's Shelter. We'll be right back with our final words. Arnie, we are back with our guest, Mark Roberts. Mark, I've been to the shelter, and it's a fantastic place. You give tours, don't you? We do. We actually we had our holiday home tour this past weekend, and uh, I think the cold kept quite a few people away on Sunday morning. Um, but we love to give tours during the day. You know, when the children are out at school, so like Monday through Friday typically, um, we love anybody that walks in and, and wants to see the home that, you know, that, that these children call home. Right to see that they're in a safe space, um, so we give those tours at our at our Buckhouse location, uh, so four nine seven eight Buckhouse Lane uh, here in Missoula, next to the Peak Health and Wellness. Um, and if you can't find it there or need our phone number, just Google us, look us up, you know Watson's Children's Shelter uh, dot org, um, and you'll get all the information right there. You know, it's a holiday mm -hmm. season. Yeah. We want our listeners to uh, put Watsons on their list and. Uh, Go buy and visit, or at least buy a uh, Amazon card or something to help them out. Help the, help them out, and I have to say this: having been here now for about ten years, and we do our Christmas for Kids every yeah. year, uh, raising money for local charity, local right. you know to take kids shopping. Right. Mark became our partner. Yes. Um, this past season, and I have to say, 
from soup to nuts, from organization ideas and just having a system in place to help us yeah. to be more successful in generating donations. These guys are second to none. It's the, I, I can't believe we didn't think of it sooner. Sure. But Mark wasn't there. So well, Mark's there I now. I know. So, Mark, thank you for that. Yeah, that was fun. It was. I'm glad that we You're could come alongside partner. you guys and, and do that. That was uh, a joy to us. Like you said, we have the systems in place, and given given those kids an opportunity to shop across this city, you know, is great. is great. Yeah, and that's the thing about Watson and Mark specifically is he's like, look, how can we help everybody do better? Sure. Right. Which I feel like that approach is the approach I wish everybody would have in, in this type, this type of work. Right. Which Absolutely. Is not how do I make Watson better, but how does everything become better? Cause at that point, Watson would be better. Correct. Right, if everybody else is doing well. So thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. And, uh, you you know, Arnie and I would love to have you back on the show, but also I want to pledge to you that if you have things that you want to work on that you need our help to raise awareness and to get the word out, we'll do it. Great. Okay. Yeah. You have Fantastic. you have access to the mic and to the, the pen yes. and the websites. We'll do whatever we can to help you. So thank you. Yeah, Mark, thank you guys. pleasure having you on the show. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, Arnie, I'll see you next Sunday. Take care, Scott. Bye. Thank you for listening to What Do You Know? I can't wait for the next show, Scott. I'm excited too, Arnie. If you'd like to suggest a guest, send me an email at scottrichman at townsquaremedia.com. We'll see you next week. And thanks for listening to News Talk KGVO. Hey guys, time to get in on the action for the biggest moments in basketball with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections, place your entry, and win up to 100 times your money. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use the code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy.